Coinbase, let's go. <laughs> First, for the viewers at home, we have all been tested for COVID and we are negative, allowing us to have this nice couch-like chat. We all know each other. I'm Fred, I co-founded Coinbase. We started the company in 2012, myself and Brian. I was at the company as co-founder and president until early 2017, still on the board, still a little bit of my baby to the extent that the board and Brian put up with my input. Did a little bit of everything. At the beginning, I did pro everything from programming to customer support at two in the morning. And uh, now I run a crypto investment firm called Paradigm that I founded with Matt Wong from Sequoia. We've been working on that for three years. Um, and proud investors in a whole bunch of the early formative crypto projects, including these guys and Antonio as well. Um, and I'm also a personal investor in, in Scalar too. Um, so it's all in the family. I'm Jacob. I was at Coinbase from January 2017 to uh, mid 2020. I started as a design intern, ended up working across the product org helped like lead and start uh, USDC at Coinbase. Today, uh, one of the co-founders of Zora, we, we think we can build a new internet based on mm -hmm. NFTs. I'm D. I'm the, uh, one of the other co-founders at Zora. I spent November 2017 through about March or April 2020 at Coinbase. Started as an auditor, wound up as a program manager, and eventually led the influencer marketing program on the comms team. So I was a bit of a jack of all trades. Hey, I'm Antonio. Uh, I was at Coinbase from 2015 to 2016 when I was a member of the payments team on the software engineering side. Currently, I'm the founder of DYDX, which is a decentralized exchange for advanced financial products uh, and also derivatives. I'm Linda. Uh, I was at Coinbase mid-2014 and left in uh, late 2017. I worked on a number of different roles there, was first on the investigations team, and then later was a product manager for internal tools. I co-founded a crypto fund called Scalar Capital and just really excited about investing in different exciting crypto projects. Jacob, I feel like you have a really good story on this front. So I joined Coinbase as a design intern. So I was coming over for what I thought was going to be three months. I was like building and messing around with projects on Ethereum in my like final year of college. And I was like very active on Twitter about it. I think that's how I came across the radar of a couple of folks at Coinbase who just kind of DM'd me being like, hey, we like what you're doing. Like, this is cool. You want to come over to San Francisco for three months? And I was like, yeah, that sounds fun. Like, I'll do that. <laughs> I told my, my family, my, my girlfriend, my friends, I was like, I'll see you in like, you know, I'll see you in March. I started in January. Yeah, weekend, I ended up signing full time, which was a shock to everyone. But at the same time, they're like, okay, I guess you're doing this crypto thing. I feel like you're skipping some juicy details even in that too. Like, yeah. like how did you find out about Coinbase originally? Or like, where did the idea originate? I wanted to join Coinbase in the first place because I read one of your blog posts yeah. very early on, uh, you were like kind of charting the territory of like early decentralized business models. I was like trying to build DAOs at the time. I was like, oh, this just seems like an amazing way to like collaborate and create with people online. And what you wrote kind of like resonated with me. So I was trying to do my own thing. And like the, when I actually got first got the DM from um, Ben Jennings, who was the head of design at the time, I, I think I said, no, I'm all good. Like I want to do my own startup. Like I'm doing my own thing. Right. And then I kind of saw your blog post and I was like, well, if I was going to work in crypto, like Coinbase seems pretty interesting. Like very strong brand, cool product, like yeah. up and coming. Yeah. I was like, all right, I'll try it out. And my honest plan was like, I'll go in for three months, learn everything I can about a crypto company, come back to Australia and keep doing my startup. <laughs> right. That did not work out. Four years later, <laughs> I was still there. Antonio, you joined Coinbase straight out of college, right? Did, yeah. Okay. So I feel like you were very early on that train. Like it was highly unusual probably for somebody to leave college and be like, I'm joining a crypto company. Yeah, especially at, uh, from Princeton, I guess. It's like everybody went to like Goldman Sachs or like Google and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> man, those people that graduate college and go work at Goldman Sachs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, what are you thinking, man? <laughs> so this is 20, what? 2015. 2015 for you. What was the thought process for you in, in joining a crypto company at the time? Yeah, I probably have a really different story than everybody else, actually, because uh, I honestly didn't understand Bitcoin like when I accepted the offer. Uh, <laughs> At least you're honest about it. <laughs> no, but like, no, I, I heard uh, I heard Fred Wilson. He came and talked at uh, at Princeton, like in one of my entrepreneurship classes. Oh, interesting. Um, 
And then I actually used Coinbase's API for like one of my school projects. So Coinbase was one of the like 20 companies I applied to senior year. I had no idea. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. And the reason I joined was because uh, Coinbase used to do a work trial, um, as you guys know, which is basically like, you know, as the last part of the interview process, I, I did my onsite. And then the recruiter was like, uh, hey, so do you want to come and fly out to San Francisco and like work with us for a week? And I was like, I have school. <laughs> <laughs> um, but luckily, I was like, I was a bad student. Uh, and I didn't go to class too, too much anyways. So I right. pieced out on class for a week and, and went out to San Francisco. And you guys put me up in a nice hotel and stuff. Yeah. But I mean, it was nice. But most importantly, I mean, I got to meet like a lot of really great people, obviously, while I was there. And, Really fortunate to still obviously have a lot of those like great relationships like to this day. And I was like, wow, there's all these like amazing smart people at this company. They're all excited about this like random thing, Bitcoin. Uh, they like told me about hashing and stuff like that. I don't know. <laughs> um, but like that's kind of why I picked like niche in the beginning was yeah. like, you know. Linda, I feel like you saw the really early work work trial days. Yeah. It was hardcore at that point. Like people, the first, I think 20 employees did a two-week work trial. What? Damn. At some point, people were like, have these reactions where it's like, hey, I have like school or I have a job, like <laughs> this is insane. Mine was pretty easy. Like I, it was like a few days long and uh, John Kathanik didn't have time for me because he was like caught up in something. And so like, he's like, go like hang out with other people and like learn stuff. And so I didn't really like work on that much. I I'm serious. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Worked out. Nothing is perfect at an early company. Yeah, I guess that's great though. I love meeting everyone. Like that's what made me want to work there. So yeah, that's really cool. And then I know I think you guys all know John, um, but to the extent you don't know his background, John was like the number one investigator at PayPal way back in the day. Like there's like books where John is in it, like putting crazy Russian mobsters who are laundering money through PayPal in jail. Fairly intimidating guy. Very but. intimidating. And then, D, obviously you intersected the company a bit later in history. And I remember it was like two in the morning. I was doing a work paper for KPMG by myself in the office, like testing audit controls, which is just like watching paint dry. It was absolutely horrible. And I was like, man, I can't do this anymore. And I logged into LinkedIn and there was a risk management specialist posting for Coinbase. And it was like six days old. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, oh man, this is amazing. I could be one of the first 10 people to apply. And so instead of applying, I just DM the recruiter, uh, Brett. And I was like, hey man, like my name's D. I wrote this white paper at KPMG that got published about blockchains. Like I've been using Coinbase for ages. Like, like how do I apply? Like, what can I do? And he was like, man, just like, can I call you? And he called me and that was like my phone screening. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this is sick. Yeah, and then he was like, oh, fast. like, could you come in for an interview? And I was like, man, well, I'm going to New York for a blockchain project. Like I was actually working on a client for KPMG in New York that was building like um, like securities trading for the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, something crazy like that. Mm -hmm. And so I was flying back and forth between New York and San Francisco for all of my Coinbase interviews, including my presentation. And I remember being like, man, this is like the most grueling interview process I've ever been through. If I don't get this, this is just some trash. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, I'm just flying back and forth. This is ridiculous. And then I remember walking out Flying back to New York, I had just left Dover Street Market. I was feeling myself. I had like the Supreme jacket on. Yeah. And I called my mom and I was like, Mom, yo, if I get this job, it's gonna change my life. <laughs> and here I am walking around the street. I was like, yo, Bitcoin's the future. And she was like, what world currency? Like the whole thing, it was hilarious. And then I remember Whoa, I got- Hold on, your mom <laughs> shouted back, one world, one currency? Yo, dead ass. <laughs> no gas. I was like, yeah, she's wow. yeah, she was tapped in. Um, and That's so I remember, impressive. Yeah, I was walking around and then, I think uh, Jeff called me and was like, hey man, like, I think you actually did it. Like, you got the job, we wanna make you the offer. I was looking at my jacket, I was like, this is the moment. <laughs> it felt great, but like, that was pretty cool. 2017, especially fall 2017, was probably the most hyped time so far in crypto's history. Like, what did it feel like joining at that time? And how do you look back on that now, given what's transpired since? Well, what's transpired since is that like, we've now gone on another meteoric rise for Bitcoin and like this bull run is insane, right? And so looking back on it, I remember walking into Coinbase for the first time and being like, wow, like it was my first experience of a tech company, 
but it felt like everything that crypto was at that moment. Like it felt like there was this hustle and bustle and this energy and it was booming. And I remember when I accepted the offer, just looking kind of back at KPMG, not in like a ha ha, but I was like, well, look, we're at 19,000, like Bitcoin cash has dropped. Like it felt like exhilarating in a way, wow. you know, like it was empowering to make that decision. And uh, to think that it was just a blip on kind of the overall crypto radar, fast forward to 2021 is pretty crazy. Well, one unique thing about all of you is you've now all started your own companies, which is pretty cool. So I, I definitely like never wanted to start a company ever. Like I was like, I'm gonna like, work at a big corporation, work my way up. And Coinbase was like the biggest risk for me. So like starting a company was like just not something I was gonna do. Mm -hmm. And just like the amount of like really talented people at Coinbase who are like leaving to start their own thing or the, the sense of like ownership and responsibility that Coinbase gave just really kind of put that idea in my head. And uh, in like late 2017, when just the amount of interest in crypto was happening and I was spending like all my spare time researching crypto. And I was like, this would be really fun to just like get to just dive in full time and like invest in this space. So mm. kind of just like decided would start a fund. It kind of just happened like out of nowhere. Antonio, I know, I think you had a slightly different mindset going in, if I remember yeah, right. Yeah, basically fact, the We might have even explicitly talked about it when yeah. you joined. I think before I joined, actually, I think I straight up told you and, uh, and Brian in the interview, uh, look, like I want to start my own company someday. And I thought like the best way to be able to do that was not to just like do it right after college. Like, you know, sure that could work, but like I felt like the thing I needed was to work at a really great company. And like I felt like that could be Coinbase and it really was. And, you know, obviously I've gotten so much, you know, learnings and value and, and great connections and everything like that out of that. So, I mean, it worked out better than my wildest dreams, but, but yeah, I mean, day one or like before day one, I was just like, Brian, I, I want to start a company. And he was like, great, that's awesome. Like, I'm excited about that. Yeah. Like, let's like think like how we can help you do that. And like that, I think is like just the most positive thing about Coinbase to me. Like the connection like after you leave too, I think is something that's like really impactful. And I think likely something not a lot of other companies have. Yeah. Five, five percent. I mean, so we, we frame this entire moment as like we're entering into an internet renaissance. Yeah. That's kind of like the, the phase that we think we're heading, like we're heading into. And like we're really specific in that, that choice of words because the, the kind of world that we're trying to help build out with um, NFTs is basically like we, I think like crypto is associated with disrupting the financial system. Mm -hmm. I think that's the starting state of crypto, not like the end state. Like disrupting finance is like, okay, great. Now we have a new way which we can create any value system that we'd like, work together on our own terms, you know, do that all natively on the internet. Like now what? I think it's like, okay, Wall Street, like cool. That is like now an accessible toolkit for anyone on the internet. Like now what can we do? And I think the moment we're heading into now is like, well, what's the next like big boss? I think it's like social media. So like social media is like kind of these like internet kingdoms or monarchs where it's like the huge walled gardens that have been built out over the past 20 years and they like define how we we create and operate on the internet and i think now crypto is starting to eat into that or kind of like knock on those walls and go well hang on a second what if we can you know take the power of social media and instead of that being owned and controlled by these huge corporations what if we can now start to create these new systems for ourselves create new mediums for ourselves and have the value and everything as part of that kind of open up. So yeah, we, we're at like day zero of that. Like I think we've only just kind of like collectively woken up to the fact that it's like, okay, like we have this amazing financial toolkit, this value toolkit, like, okay, how does that start to permeate into culture itself, creation of, you know, art or media or, or really anything on the internet? Um, so yeah, it's like, 5% if that, 1%. Antonio, I want to reel it back to you for a second. Um, given you're working on more of the financial infrastructure, can you just tell us briefly what DYDX is, what the company you started is? Yeah, DYDX is a decentralized exchange and we focus on more advanced financial products and specifically derivatives. Um, and I've just been building that out for the past three and a half years now. So folks may have heard of the term DeFi. You're obviously in that bucket. Can you explain briefly what's different about DeFi than the traditional financial system and how might the financial system look different in crypto land? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think there are three main aspects where DeFi is important, and you kind of have to realize like the backdrop of how crypto started in terms of obviously centralized exchanges, and that's like why we're sitting here. But DeFi is really important for a couple of reasons. I mean, first of all, self custody. This is something that's really important for crypto. Just like you know, the whole point of Bitcoin arguably is like be your own bank, like own your own keys. Um, but then you kind of turn around and then we saw like the very like early days or it's still to this day, I mean, in crypto 10 years later where it's like, uh, okay, you want to actually use crypto. Okay. Like give your keys over to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Binance or like Coinbase or whoever, um, and you kind of like almost lost like the entire point, like at the, uh, right off the bat. So, so just in DeFi, I mean, the, the biggest point is that you can truly own your own keys. Um, you can truly just like own your own positions. Uh, another really important part of it is transparency. And I think this is something where, you know, this doesn't really exist in the traditional financial systems where you can just have true auditability into the state of the overall uh, like health of the market. And this is especially important, we think, like in derivative contracts where, you know, not only when you're trading a derivative contract is the exchange you're trading on custodying your funds, it's also responsible for the entire how your contract basically works. Um, and with DeFi, we can just code these smart contracts uh, into code uh, and right. have it live on the blockchain, have it be open source, have it be accessible to more people in more places. And I think that's a really powerful thing. Finance itself hasn't really changed in a big way in the past like you know, 50 to 100 years or so. Um, but now you can just kind of build this entirely parallel financial system, just like codifying everything into these smart contracts. And that's a really powerful thing. I think you might have walked over to me and said, nice socks. <laughs> <laughs> that like, sounds very plausible. <laughs> like dressed in like full Yeezy <laughs> attire. <laughs> it was exhilarating to be on the 31st floor of the Coinbase office. And you would see people who were building literally world changing products, but they were sitting in a nook <laughs> like, like, like this, right? Or like, or like somebody like sitting under a table in the kitchen, like, and, and they're literally working on how we roll out like asset additions or how we figure out custody or like, like all of the things that have now become this behemoth of a financial institution. Like we were watching people build that, but like they were wearing shorts and t-shirts. There was dogs everywhere. There were like, the whole vibe felt like you were in this uh, almost like tech utopia weird moment where like we could do anything we could be anything and like the world was kind of catching up to where we were headed and that felt pretty empowering i remember just thinking wow this is a pretty nice desk i was just i don't know i was really <laughs> i was just really geeking out on the environment i was like i had my backpack on i'm like i'm an intern this is gonna be great i remember uh i think being shocked at being like hey so we want to completely redesign the entire like mobile app can you do that and i was like <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> um, and I remember uh, I actually ended up sitting next to uh, Brian for probably like three or four months because he was like very deeply involved in that whole process going from the, the first version of the, the iOS app into, you know, the skeleton of what the app is today. And I remember just I think one of the great things of uh, Coinbase is that like really, really good at empowering like one finding very interesting or like non-normal talent, people that are just kind of like found in like the corners of subreddits or Twitter or like all these weird wacky places on the internet, mm -hmm. bringing them into Coinbase and then just empowering them with these like crazy ambitious projects and just mm -hmm. like assuming and trusting that you can just like figure it out. So in my like first, you know, three to six months going from intern and then joining full time was like, yeah, okay, literally just help redesign the app that millions of people use every day and like working directly with Brian you know, working with all these incredible like engineers and people across the whole company. I just remember being blown away where I was like, okay, this seems literally insane, but I guess it's like there's me and one of the designer right now, like we have to figure it out. Like it's very exhilarating, kind of stressful, but um, exciting and terrifying, which seems to be like the permanent state of crypto. <laughs> It's like, if it's, if it's not either of those things, then something's off. It's funny, you're making me realize how deeply ingrained uh, empowering people mm -hmm. is in the company's DNA and doing it with talent that might be unproven or seemingly unproven at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I mean, just going back to the founding of the company, Brian and I literally met on Reddit. Right. 
crazy. It's crazy. So it's like <laughs> yeah. right there. Yeah. And then I think a lot of people that ultimately joined the company, they came from crypto Twitter. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it, in that sense, it very much is an internet first company mm -hmm. um, in, its, in its social structure. And then, of course, one of the awesome things I think all you guys may have experienced is when something is growing a lot, you need all hands on deck, and there's no option, Jacob, as you're describing, but to empower people to get stuff done. Mm -hmm. At that point in time, um, was getting very deep into early decentralized exchanges. Um, so was got super deep into it to the point where I was like, if I get passionate about something, I don't shut up about it. And I wasn't shutting up about like, we should get into decentralized exchange. And I remember um, the leadership team was like, okay, just let us, you can pitch it one time and then you know we'll hear you out. That ended up leading to the acquisition of the Paradex team, which was like a fun experience. After Paradex, um, I was then the, the founding PM of um, USDC. So I got to work with the amazing team at um, Circle and helped um, you know bring the USDC like stablecoin into fruition. Right, a couple billion dollars of that stablecoin outstanding today now. I think it's over ten billion dollars now, which is like kind of surreal. But I remember that was an amazing project because Coinbase was probably 500, 600 people at the time, and it was basically me, two other engineers got locked in a room for like three months and was basically like go build this. Yeah, I think that that's been my favorite project I work on at Coinbase for sure. But my favorite was definitely the first key generation ceremony. I felt like I was in some cross between like crypto meets Mr. Robot meets like like the ultimate adrenaline rush. I remember being in the office at like 11 and literally hearing Zach, who was the uh, like the, the crypto engineer at the time, like playing the Mr. Robot theme song, doing a dry run, of, uh, doing a dry run. Like we were packing all the bags that we had to take to this undisclosed location. We were all in three different suburbans. It was insane. And like set up a Faraday cage in an apartment, ripped the Wi-Fi out. And like, I remember being in this tent with no Wi-Fi, no cell signal for like six or seven hours, listening to stories from Julian Borey, one of like the early security engineers. It was just insane. And like, for me, that was like as deep crypto as I could get. Like we were generating the keys for the cold storage system at Coinbase for the first time we were ever gonna use this new system. Like that was like, hacking the mainframe. <laughs> and Julian now is literally working on the firmware that will go into your brain at Neuralink. Yes. Insane, so right? <laughs> Insane. That was definitely, it was the most like core to Coinbase in my early tenure. Like I felt like I was actually contributing to something that was really gonna like impact or matter to the company. And it was the first time I got to cross over into like the real like crypto inside of things where I was like, oh man, like this is the team that's actually building the systems that I use every day, which was pretty dope. I want to roll back to uh, what crypto was like a number of years ago when y'all joined. One of the really cool things that I got to have at Coinbase was just a really great like front row seat to seeing what was happening in the space at that point. Because at that point in 2015, it was like this 100-person-ish company, um, like I said, very niche. Like nobody cared about what we were doing except for like the random people that were like trading crypto at that point. But that allowed us to just basically have a ton of, first of all, like the really best people in the space, first of all, at the company at the time, but also like everybody else in crypto who was doing cool things at the time came to Coinbase and like talked to us. And I remember like Vitalik came and talked to us like really early on about like smart contracts. I remember you gave like a presentation about like gas usage like on Ethereum. And I think it just took all of us like a long time to like wrap our minds around it. But at least personally for me, like once I finally was able to wrap my mind around it, I was like, oh, wait, this is actually a totally new paradigm of computing. Um, and therefore, like there must be like interesting things that you could build on top of smart contracts in Ethereum. Yeah, Linda, any reflections from that period? Uh, yeah, so I joined mid-2014 and um, the price of Bitcoin was $600 around there. And then it crashed to 200 for like a while. And it stayed there for a very long time. And I remember just like the headlines in the news were like, Bitcoin is dead, like no one's interested in Bitcoin. And I remember like people actually like texting me like, hey, I saw like Bitcoin's not doing well. Like, are you okay? Like, is it, you know, like, is, yeah. is, do you want to come back to finance? And so I remember that was like a weird time, but internally, like- Come uh, back to finance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, but uh, I remember internally, like, I didn't feel that at all. Like, mm. there was so much excitement. Like, 
every time you talk to someone, they were like super passionate about Bitcoin, really saw like the future of what this could be. Uh, back then, it was a lot of like focus on merchant adoption and how like Bitcoin was like peer to peer cash and it would be really cheap and instant. And so I remember that huge like, you know, onboarding like all these like giant name merchants. And I thought that was really cool. But over time, uh, Bitcoin kind of the narrative progressed into digital gold. So that was like a very different shift in like focus. Yeah, and that was definitely wrong in retrospect. Yeah, at least yeah, it, the, was or it was way ahead of its time. Yes, maybe. Yeah. Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. Absolutely. Um, and then so Ethereum, when that came along, was really interesting. Uh, so my husband and I, uh, Will, we used to we would go down to Palo Alto and, and attend these like Ethereum meetups and there would be like five, ten people there. And they were like crazy, like super interesting, like talking about DAOs and all these things like at the time. And we just both got super deep down that rabbit hole. And I just remember thinking that was like a really different moment. And um, I was really excited when Ethereum got added. I might not be like the whole crypto anarchist side where I, I do think that uh, traditional finance will still exist. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that a lot of people who are excluded from the system will actually be able to participate in this like open financial system. And I, I think that people will be able to like get loans through DeFi and not have to like like send all this paperwork over to this bank and then get denied after like a one month process. So yeah. Well, I, how, how is explain that? How is DeFi different than the traditional financial system? Like. What why what makes it so that anybody can use it? Uh, anyone can access DeFi. So like uh, right now, um, the system requires you to like put up collateral in order to get out a loan. But I actually think over time we're going to have decentralized reputation and identity, yeah. where people can just like build up their reputation on the blockchain. And I'm super excited. Like you can have people um, like who just are really good members of the community and who've like shown their work over years actually now be able to take out loans and not have to go through the banking process. So I, I'm super excited by just like all the things that are enabled that are just past like what even exists in traditional finance. Like we're gonna have like when you combine with NFTs and DAOs, like we're gonna have things that like you've just never seen before in societies. So I guess there's two things. So I think like Coinbase, uh, my favorite product there is, is USDC because it's like it's taking all the powerful things of Coinbase and like very meaningfully bringing it into mm -hmm. DeFi. Yeah. It's like, well, you literally have a US dollar that is powered by everything that crypto gives you. It's like it's transparent, it's programmable, and it lets you build things like DYDX and all of these other like protocols on top of it. So I think one of my my favorite things in in DeFi is like is Uniswap, which you know is kind of the has a weird history as to why these socks are like tied to it. But Uniswap is kind of fascinating because it is the I mean, it feels like the spiritual success of the Coinbase in a lot of ways because it's it's exchange, but it is, you know, community owned. It is entirely permissionless and protocol based, and any developer on the planet can get the power of the New York Stock Exchange or Coinbase with a single function call in like twelve dollars, right. depending on gas price. Like Uniswap to me, actually feels like the progression of like it's the like it moves us away from like what is like money itself or currency. Currency is a medium of exchange. What is Uniswap? It is literally a, like a medium of exchange. And like to think about that, or just kind of put that in terms, it's like so Uniswap lets you move from any token to any other token um, seamlessly. It'll, you know, using the, the function, it'll just go like, well, this is the real time price between these two things. If you think about like why money was invented in the first place, it was like, well, bartering was like, it's kind of hard. It's like, well, what is the real time price between this loaf of bread and this bunch of rocks I need to build my house? Like you can't figure that out. Money kind of served as the medium of exchange there. Mm -hmm. Uniswap is like, well, what is kind of liquid bot? This was not why it was created, but I think it's where it's taking us. It's like, well, now you can have a literal medium of exchange between any two tokens and those tokens can represent physical objects like a pair of socks that was tokenized. So these socks were, there was only 500 created. You needed to buy this socks token. You redeem it, which means you burn it and you get a real pair of socks like these shipped to your house. What that means is kind of crazy is because you have the real time price of these pair of socks, which it, when they started was I think like a couple of dollars and now it's anywhere between 90 to $110,000, which is just ridiculous. Those are some expensive socks. Very expensive wear. socks. I yeah. wish I never redeemed these ones, but you know, that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, I unfortunately have worn my Unisox too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Regrettable. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that gives you a glimpse of where DeFi is heading. And it's kind of funny because we have to describe DeFi in the terms of the prior financial system. 
It's kind of like trying to predict Facebook in like 1990s internet. It's like, well, you can be your own magazine and you can publish your own, yeah. you know, images. And like, it's really clunky to kind of get a sense of, you know, publishing and like creating your own magazine is like, well, that's my Instagram profile. The fact that we still have to describe a lot of the actions of crypto using traditional nomenclature kind of tells you just how early it is. And there are new words that like come out of it like minting an NFT, like that's, a, like that's kind of like a new phrase that gives you a sense of like, okay, there's an entirely new thing happening here. But when we talk about exchange and yeah, but it, it's very early. Staking, farming, Staking, all these farming, yep, yep. Did you think that NFTs would get this level of public exposure this soon? No, no, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. no. So I, I, I feel the same way. I thought there was no way in hell. Yeah, no chance. Everything prior in crypto, I feel like, has grown out of the existing crypto user base. Correct, yeah. And then all of a sudden, I feel like, you know, the crypto insider community had this funny moment where it was like, wait a second. It turns out that, like, not that many people are that interested in, like, this weird new idea of money. It turns out everybody's interested in like art and culture. Yes. Like that's literally the whole population. <laughs> and so there's been this funny this funny inflow. Linda, I saw you shaking your head yes that you did expect. Yeah, well, I, I think I was too early. Like I was super excited by NFTs and I was like, oh, like everyone's gonna collect these in-game items, like they're gonna be swapping yeah. them, wearing them as skins, um, gonna be displaying like in VR. Like I was kind of like way too ahead of it, and it took like several years for it to like actually play out. And um, DeFi like really took off during that time. And so um, I was like, oh, maybe no one cares about this. But I'm super stoked about NFTs, especially on the gaming side. Like, I really think that there's a lot of cool things you can do, like especially virtual lands, like like owning and developing real estate and like virtual lands. Like that's that's so cool. Um, and be able to like rent out your items to other people. Like I, I just think there's so much design possibilities there. And I'm, I'm really bullish on that space. It's like with NFTs and with where we're headed with like this whole explosion of NFTs and ownership, right? It's like now you can be your own like publishing house. You could be your own gallery. You could be your own marketplace. Like, yeah. it's really an extension of the spiritual philosophy that like powered Bitcoin in the first place. It's just now that like the be your own fill in the blank happens to intersect with media and culture. So like NFTs really are like a, a genuine paradigm shift in owning information, owning media on the internet itself. They're kind of like turning into the the atomic unit of the internet in a lot of ways. They're like the the fundamental problem it, it solves was that like pre NFTs pre crypto. The way that you would like capture and extract value from information would be to like restrict access to it. Where it was like, well, for you to like generate money from this blog post or from this video, you had to like put it in a walled garden that was built out of like advertising or subscription or pay per view. And the paradox was like, build a walled garden that fit every single person in the, in the world, like inside of it, which is like kind of the social media platforms that we see today. And it was mostly those platforms that would like capture the value from it, right? It's like you post for free. On Instagram, you get paid in likes and followers back, but like the advertising revenue goes to the platform itself. If you're big enough, maybe you get pennies on the dollar, but like that's a very select few number of people. With NFTs, it's like, well, no, it's actually the complete inversion. You can make that piece of information and media entirely free, universally accessible yeah. to the internet, but still own it as an asset and capture that value which is probably much more in line with what the internet should be. It's like free and accessible information. Made. I think zooming out, if we were to like bridge kind of what we were talking about here with Bitcoin first and now what we're talking about with NFTs, it feels like we're closing the first chapter on crypto, if you will, in many ways. And like that first chapter was like hyper financial, but now the second chapter, it looks like it can be much more about the truly open internet. Like first it was like open finance, ownership, value, and now it's just like, open information, open publishing, open media, which which really increases or widens the top of the funnel in a lot of ways that I think is exciting for the second chapter. And so like as we close this first one, I think like the like what's next for for Bitcoin? It's like sovereign wealth funds and like you know public balance sheets and like yeah. real like government acceptance, right? And it's like that's like the last frontier there and like once we conquer that, like what does it look like for the broader internet? And I think for the broader internet, it's a lot of what Jacob was saying just now, which is like, it's like social media. It's the way we interact with one another on a daily basis outside of just like a Venmo. <laughs> but much more of like, hey, check out my photos, check out my family, check out my videos. And I think owning that media and making it permanent in a way that's like written to our collective memory that is Ethereum is pretty powerful. I feel like sometimes uh, I find I even need to check myself in that I realize we've all been working on crypto for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. So the idea of like crypto as a digital money to all of us is like, oh yeah, of course, like that's obvious now. Yeah. 
but I, a lot of people might just be experiencing that for the first time. Um, so that, that in and of itself feels like maybe that's 10% into its eventual trend. Yeah. DeFi, it kind of happened two and a half years ago, feels like it may be less than 1% if that really is a new ground up financial system. And then D to your point, broad internet application platform, if that's really the next wave of crypto and where we're going, that's at like zero maybe. Mm -hmm. First step. Let's say crypto really, really works. What does that look like in 20 or 30 years? I think it's gonna, a lot of people are gonna be using crypto on a daily basis and just not realize it. It's gonna be pretty abstracted away and anyone who wants to use it and participate in crazy things like DAOs and forms of organization with people all over the world that are anonymous, like I think that they can totally join that system and it, there will be really popular groups that are formed around that. But otherwise, like I'm really excited when this does get abstracted away, everything's way more efficient, accessible, global, um, and I think it's gonna to touch upon like all types of industries, not just finance too. It's hard, right? Like it's really hard to like build a lot of these things from like a technical perspective. It's hard to like build network effects from zero. So it takes time. But if we're talking about, I guess, uh, as the prompt says, like 20 to 25 years from now, I think it's not unreasonable that we could have built, you know, collectively in the space an open financial system for the world. Mm -hmm. And I think just the ramifications of that and the benefits of that are massive and I'm excited to work towards it. I mean, it's kind of an impossible question in the way. I feel like, in a way, we're like, what, 30 years into the internet, and I don't think anyone could really articulate what the internet's gonna be like in 30 years. I mean, you can, but it's, it's crazy. I guess crypto as an ownership system and value systems generally, I think what that means fundamentally is like, well, how do we work together? How do we decide what is valuable to create, to, to own, to like work on? So I think to get you know, to sketch that at a high level, it's like, well, any group of people, no matter where they are on the planet, if they share a common view or have an idea for what the world can be, there is this value system and toolkit, which means that they can congregate around that idea and, and can work on that together. Um, have, you know, use the tools of, of finance to, you know, bring that capital together as, you know, could be 10,000 people on Reddit or a mix of people on, Twitter or whatever, if they have a shared idea of what the world can be, they now have the, the toolkit of what you would associate with a startup, but now that is native to the internet. So it's like, well, if a group of people on every corner of the earth want to go create a new village or fund the studies of like some new crazy speculative area of science or, you know, fund an education system or literally whatever, it's like, I think you should be able to just create together on the internet. Um, and do whatever you want, provided there's more. It could just be you as an individual, but ideally there's there's probably, if you've got a crazy idea, there's probably a thousand people like you across the planet that have that same idea. It and now you have a medium to work together and do that, yeah. Yeah, it feels like if the internet was like a revelation in humanity's interconnectedness, mm -hmm. like I could see myself in my common person because I could now see like all people at all times, it feels like, Crypto is kind of an evolution in our interoperability and the ability for us to like coordinate as humanity and as society and like in that coordination be able to produce real world outcomes that are beyond just the internet. But like, like I mean, look at like we could build cities, like we could physically manifest things with this sort of coordination opportunity that we have now that I think is we haven't seen that ever for humanity, which is pretty powerful. Well, that's a lot of potential for crypto to live up to over the next 20, 30 years. Fingers crossed. Well, thanks guys for joining and also for doing all the building you did at Coinbase and now as founders in the crypto ecosystem too. The diaspora continues and uh, see all out there in the metaverse. <laughs> yeah. Catch you on the internet. Yeah. <laughs>